something that's easy, just the way it's growing in nature, and it's truly whole food. So we are today the largest single buyer for jackfruit in the world, having pioneered the supply chains and the product development for jackfruit, and we're about 70% of all retail jackfruit product sales, and just continuing to focus on scaling up. Now, all your, all your products are available nationally, but when we were first starting out, what is the main strategy that helps you convince retailers to pick up your products? I mean, we literally went for it for, uh, we didn't know how things worked, to be honest. So we'll, we are very open about things we didn't know at the beginning. And uh, we walked a couple of foods and we said, hey, we've got this product. You want to see my dairy on your shelves? And we had this super food like cash packaging. It was a uh, brown sugar paper and black and white sticker. Um, Grocery stores made it up, but we've never seen anything like this. And I mean, they got on shelves at Whole Foods after being just in farmers markets and a couple of local grocery stores after about six or eight months. Uh, and we used that same packaging for years until we changed it to something that was a little, a little different. But we just we found it the main thing. We utilized that stress a lot um, in our early days of marketing, and so we would go. We'd be able to speak directly to our core audience and hear what they were telling us, um, and then. We live in an area where we had a lot of tourism. People were coming, visiting our veg fest, visiting us at farmers markets, and going back to their homes and finding that they didn't have mobile foods on the shelf. So they were emailing us and saying, hey, I live in Maryland, we want your products. Um, so we would Google, hey, natural food stores in Maryland, and we would then call them up and say, hey, we've got this product in North Carolina. And we were FedExing packages all over the country at the beginning, just by making phone calls. Well, you know, I, I just want to mention something that no one has. I mean, there's three uh, retail brands up here, and we're all women. So I'm wondering if that's the future of uh, brands. Yeah, and so it's really exciting uh, to be able to, the two of you who are much younger and spirited and all this great stuff. But, but for us, you know, I think the packaging really is important. From the very, very beginning, we wanted to create a package that would look very mainstream, enticing, our, uh, aesthetic, beautiful to look at, and I think our package really, really impressed retailers when we went to them because it was so beautiful. It's not the same package that we made it more mainstream, much more vibrant, much more uh, with the ability to pop from the shelf, which is something that our first packaging didn't do. But our first package was really, really beautiful and and sort of French in appeal, and I think that uh, really helped. But I think at the time that we launched this about five years ago. There really was not a huge, uh, you know, I don't know, let's just be honest, vegan cheese was kind of like the laughing stock of the natural food industry. No one took it seriously. And what we were trying to do is elevate that, make it something that was akin to traditional cheese, something that you could really, really be proud of. And I think we were able to communicate that successfully through flavor, texture, appearance, and packaging to retailers. And I think that's how we landed uh, I got up to try it two times. I was initially working on ripe jackfruit, and I thought that you know, the fact that I was helping farmers would be enough to sell products, and I got to learn more in a way that it's not. <laughs> um, it just wasn't something that delivered enough value to the consumer. It was sort of like a different type of dried mango, and so you're also probably familiar with the dried fruits are very commoditized, it's, it's private label, it wasn't really a good opportunity to build a brand. Um, so when I, when I stumbled across a young jackfruit farming family and made a young jackfruit burger for me and um, went to the, the alternative category and you know, tried a bunch of the products, looked at the ingredient labels and saw this huge open opportunity for something that's really just you know, whole food. Um, the biggest success factor for us, especially because we didn't have any where we really you know, marketing dollars to spend to, to create education and awareness about jackfruit at a time when no one had ever heard of it, was delivering on an unmet need in that category. The consumers, 50% you know, of people who were eating that category felt like the food was too processed. So we were able to meet that, that unmet need and the product sold itself. Uh, so the only question is, having all this experience that you have now, what is one thing you should do with Oh, I guess one, well, you know, there's a lot of things. I mean, come on. When you're starting a company and you're growing it in this age where a business can, you know, double, triple every single year, uh, the fact of the matter is the plant-based food industry has never been where it is today, where so many innovators, entrepreneurs are jumping in, 
like you guys, that maybe first time business and just really, really being able to scale rapidly. So there's a million things you don't know when you start. Many of us as founder entrepreneurs aren't MBA. So we didn't come out of college knowing how to do this. We didn't come out of business school knowing how to run a business. We had an idea, we were creative people, and we had to figure out how to create that business. So there's a million things you don't know. But one of the things that I think that I underestimated in the very, very beginning was the amount of advice, guidance, and wisdom that I could gain from our investors, from our board of directors. Um, you know, rather than thinking of them as perhaps enemies that want to replace you with that MBA that has a lot more experience, um, if you lean on them and gain the insight and, uh, and realize that you're a sponge, that you actually have a lot of learnings that can come your way, I think that can be hugely, hugely powerful. It's something that I've had to learn. Uh, I, it really is how do you become a leader? How do you, when you scale a business, it's not just about the great product, but it's how you build teams. It's how you build infrastructure. It's how you build a culture and maintain that culture and create a company that where everybody is aligned in terms of mission and dedication. And being able to do that requires uh, working on yourself and developing as a leader. And I wish I hadn't known that in the very, very beginning. It was very rocky in the beginning for me the first couple of years. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really happy to say that because of the wonderful help of the board of directors, because of the wonderful team that I built, and the great people around me that also helped me, we've been able to grow together. That was a very good answer. Uh, I am mean, thinking for myself, I, I wouldn't have played it so safe. I think if I knew what I know now then, I would have taken more risks and I wouldn't have been so afraid to grow more quickly. Um, we did everything very, very slowly, very, very organically, and it was super intensely hands-on in the beginning. Mike and I were doing everything. When I say we're DIY, like I mean we were DIY. We were holding other jobs in the beginning as well. Uh, I was bartending and he was a server at a restaurant. So we were like really hustling. I bartend until three or four in the morning. I wake up, I go to a farmer's market at 6 a.m. the next day. So there wasn't a lot of downtime. We were doing our bookkeeping, we were driving our shipments around to uh, you know, every regional grocery store within an hour and a half distance of us. We were doing the deliveries ourselves. For, for a good number of years, at least two years in, um, I had a baby about two years uh, into the business and I remember at early ages sending invoices with one hand while resting a baby with the other. Like we really, really kept everything so small in the beginning because we didn't know what we had um, to a certain extent. And I think if we did know what we had, we might have reached out sooner for resources in the way that Neil was talking about and um, listen to people more about we've got something here. Believe, believe it. I think that was the harder part. It took us a few years to actually believe that we really had this company and that we really had something that was resonating with our consumers and that was different, that was unique, and that filled a void in people's lives and brought people together. And so if I knew that sooner, I would have you know, maybe brought on investment sooner so that we could grow bigger and build our team more so that my work-life balance wasn't so insane. You know, I, I would have still worked just as hard, but I think bringing in the resources and building the team earlier on uh, would only stand to benefit us as we grew. I wish I would have been coached more on the right balance between strategy and execution. Uh, there's definitely, for me, uh, coming right out of school and, and starting to work full time in a company, I said that I really needed to know how to do everything in order to, to move forward in the right way. And ultimately, you, don't, you really don't know how to, you, don't, you really don't need to know how to do stage five when you're on stage zero. And you really just need to know how to get from stage zero to stage one. And if you can execute on those things, um, you're gonna that like that's the most important thing for you to do. Like if you never get to stage four, you never know, you never need to know how to go from stage four to stage five. And I think like there's a lot of um, you know, I, I remember having conversations with different advisors and like you know, incubator programs and there's a lot of folks who will tell you what you should do and not enough conversation about how you should do, like how how you're doing, how you're spending your time in a day and about like execute because time is not on your side trying to build a company um, in a very competitive space. So figuring out that right balance can execute.
execution and strategy. And I think also there's a, once you figure that out and, and realize like, oh my god, I need to get from this stage to that stage, um, making sure that you're still leaving at least enough space to think about strategy and make the plan. Are there any uh, books or resources that help uh, any of the basics before you kind of move on to the next stages? Yeah, I, I didn't have a lot of time for book reading in the beginning because we were doing you know, all of all of the things all at once. Um, but we did have time to have conversations with people in our community. Um, so we tried really hard to learn from everyone that was around us. And we are really good at knowing what we don't know. So we go out and we ask questions. We met with other entrepreneurs in our area we're doing sort of similar things, um, and we just ask questions, and we're just like, hey, how did you do this? Because we've grabbed our companies, so we know we're bigger than all of them now. We've surpassed them, which has been really incredible to see. They're coming to us now to ask us for advice, and it feels really wonderful that we can now give them our experience and kind of close that loop, because they were so influential and um, just inspiring for us in the beginning, and now we sort of blossomed and grown, and then we're able to give that back to them. So, I mean, our resources were, was our community. Um, and it, it, it expands beyond our local community of entrepreneurship, um, where we're from in Asheville, but we reached out to other companies all around the country, and they were so helpful, particularly in the plant-based world. Um, it's, not, it's not a closed community. People are very, very open with like what worked for them and what didn't work for them, and they just want to see everyone succeed, and that was really important to us to understand at the beginning. Um, we think when you have something that's proprietary or you know, very close to you, it's your business, it's your baby, you want to protect it, um, at, at, you know, for anything. But when I started asking questions, you know, Martin Kruger, the um, chief operating officer of Follow Your Heart, he was so helpful. Everyone was so kind. Yoko has been wonderful to us. She's, she always answers her emails in like a second. I called her one time at 6 a.m. not remembering the time change in California. She's like, it's fine. I'm just here feeding the cows. Like, don't worry about it. And that community is so awesome and has been remarkably uh, influential and just uh, amazing to us. So we use your community. Yeah, you know, I think it, it would behoove most uh, founders to join a mastermind group. Usually there is some sort of CEO mastermind group. I joined, joined one in our area, uh, sort of a consortium of national food companies. And, you know, many that are much bigger and go into these meetings and discuss it very tactical things such as, let's say, trade spend. How do, how do you deal with that? Or marketing dollars, uh, or, you know, or just uh, human resources, uh, best hiring practices, etc. And you have that, that room of that brain power that you can pull from. It's very, very helpful. The Plant-Based Foods Association has a mentoring program. Uh, in, in the ability to network with other companies, and this is what I'm saying, you know, it's just really, really powerful to be able to connect with other companies and share the knowledge and the wisdom and the resources. Yeah, definitely agree with everything you just said. Um, it's one of the reasons I moved the company from Boston to Boulder. In Boston, it just felt like being a food company, um, especially at that time, um, you were kind of on the sidelines and we were really focused on pharma, medical, tech, biotech. And um, when I relocated the company to Boulder, it felt like living in an incubator. So just with all the food executives and experienced people around. So when you all started your companies, Whole Foods was a kind of different piece. It wasn't on the Amazon yet. It was not easy to get those workers, but easier, I'd say. Um, so with that in mind, what do you see as the biggest hurdle for entrepreneurs and the Sorry, I can't hear you. I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Right. What do you see as the biggest hurdle uh, for entrepreneurs entering the food world today? The biggest hurdle for entrepreneurs today? Well, you know, I think I think that depends on who the entrepreneur is, what your product is. It could be financial. Maybe it's raising the capital to do what you want to do. It could be operational. How do you scale? How do you commercialize these products that may be completely innovative where there's not a roadmap on how you do that? You need to figure it out yourself, which is uh, you know, something that's that's an added burden to a lot of the, the innovation today with new technology. Uh, it could be human resources. Uh, it could be leadership. There's so many hurdles. Um, I think in terms of the retail landscape, retailers are avidly looking for products such as ours. Never before have you seen a major conventional retailer such as Target, Walmart, uh, 
the club stores like Costco, uh, reaching out Kroger, reaching out to companies such as ours because they're trying to expand their plant-based sets because this is the new direction. So I honestly think that landing a retailer is one of the easier hurdles to overcome. It's really all the operational ones. You know, there's been a, uh, when the Omni launched last year, we found that store shelves were empty because they couldn't scale fast enough. We have the same problem in 19, uh, in 2018. I'm saying 19, that tells you how old I am. 2018, um, our fill rate, which means the percentage of orders that we fulfilled, was about 70%. There were times towards the end of the year we were down to 50% because we just couldn't fill orders. And we had retailers threatening to cut us off, to, to that they would lose, we were going to lose that shelf space. We did lose a uh, central market in Texas because we weren't, they got tired of having empty shelves. And if you can't fill that shelf, you're going to put some other product on it. So that is one of the things I hear the most from young companies today is that they're trying to commercialize, they're trying to scale, whether through their own manufacturing or through Coke manufacturing, and they can't scale fast enough, and retailers are getting upset. So it's not landing that retail space, it's keeping it. Yeah, I agree with a lot of things that Ayla just said, uh, especially that we, earning the retailers is not the biggest hurdle. Uh, I think because the landscape right now in these foods is so competitive that retailers are hungry for you, but how do you get your customer base to be hungry for you too? And I think that uh, being able to be authentic and truly craft a brand is going to become even more important because what's going to make your product different from the 15 other new products that are trying to get into the interstate space because it is such a hot category right now. What sets you apart? How do you differentiate not only what you make, but who you are and why you make what you make? And I think that um, a recipe is only so good, and, and to a certain extent, someone could make that same thing, but you cannot be replicated. So keep your brand close, um, develop your voice, figure out who, what your messaging is and who you are and, and why you're doing what you're doing, and try your best to communicate that with your audience because that's what's going to keep that vibe from you, in addition to great tasting products, uh, over the other person. Um, and when you start getting a little bit bigger, you try to figure out, you know, how can I outsource operations? How can I bring on someone to take over leadership on finance? How do I, you know, build my team? Keep your brand close as long as you can. Don't outsource that. Uh, a lot of people just think it's really easy to just use a marketing agency to craft your message. Don't do that. Keep it close to you as long as possible until you really, truly know who you are. I would reference the competition as well. I think there's so much talent coming into the food space now that wasn't there before. And if you think about like my own journey coming into food, I mean, if I had tried to start my company a few decades prior, I mean, no way. Like it was, I was relying on Google. I mean, I had no background in food. I had no connections in food. Um, and like, it was just figuring it out. And that's something that like the internet and like LinkedIn have enabled now. So you've got people who never would have been in food before running into food. It's also driven by the investments coming into food, you know, people seeing a lot of money being made in food. There's a ton more competition now um, than there was before. I mean, food is an avenue to change the world. I think it's also just better understood now than it ever has been before. So um, there's a competition, and that just means that your know, time is not on your side in a way that it might have been more so before. I think about, like, you know, the, the time it took for me to learn how to be an effective CEO. Like, if I was starting the Jackfruit Company today, I don't have that kind of time. Um, it, it was, you know, I started working on Jackfruit before plant based was a word, before plant based was a movement, and that meant that I had time to learn. Um, but it was because I started on something before, you know, anyone else thought that it had a reason to be. So, time um, and really having a point of differentiation. So, figure out what's going to give you an advantage to be able to win. And you know, I, I just want to ask something. You mentioned that, yes, there's a lot more competition today. I mean, I, too, have, have had many vegan companies. And back in the 1990s, I had a company that made, uh, you know, at the time we called them meat substitutes or meat alternatives. And um, the timing was not right. It was too early. You know, they, they, they were, of course, there was still Turkey. We were the second leading Turkey alternative in the country. Um, but the fact is, it's competition that's growing the category. If there weren't so many players in the 
egg and cheese category, we wouldn't be taking market share away from animal cheese. We have to think about the fact that 14% of the food and milk category now consists of alternative milks or you know, plant-based milks. According to Cargill, that's going to be over 40% by 2024. So it's growing exponentially. Imagine where it's going to be in 10 years. So it's going to, because of the competition, because of the plethora of new brands that are coming out there, it will take market share away. And we cannot grow this category as single brands. That's what we were back in the 1990s. There were maybe you know, a handful of companies making these substitutes, or you know, there was even less of meat and cheese at the time. We need all these companies, all this competition, in order to grow the category and take market share away from animal products. There's room enough for all of us, and we just all have to do our best and collaborate together to expand and take market share away from, you know, from animal agriculture. How do you integrate uh, authenticity, uh, authenticity, I can't say that word, integrity into your brands? How do you integrate integrity into your brands and how do you communicate that to the customers? We do it in a, a number of different ways. Um, it's really integrated into who we are, so we're a brand uh, because Mike and I started it because of the desire to do rather than the desire to sell. It's always been sort of an inherent part of us. We've been able to uh, use our brand as a platform to amplify our voice on issues that matter to us. So even our packaging has little environmental high fives inside. So before someone's even taste of the product, they're feeling good about the choice they made to take it home with them. Um, and we use social media a lot um, to communicate the things that we're doing and the partnerships that we have with our community organizations. Uh, we, you know, like everyone else, when you buy a vegan product, you're already getting you know, animal welfare, you're already getting environmental and you're already hitting public health and improvements in uh, people's well-being. So how do you go beyond that? You know, you're already ticking all those boxes just by, by way of having a vegan product. So for us, it's always trying to identify what the next step is. How can we do more? How can we, you know, our whole name is, is no evil foods because it's built on the concept of do no evil. So what that means to us is not perfection, but it's how can we put more good into the world. So we're really always trying to make partnerships by who we support and then mobilizing that and being very front and center about um, our social justice and initiatives and partnerships that we are um, part of our contributions to schools for Oaxaca um, through the sales of our Zapatista chorizo product that is all very integrated into who we are and how we communicate with our audience. Yeah, I'm going to echo everything the same was said. I mean, we, you know, first of all, you have to figure out who you are as a company. What is your vision and why did you start it? And if you really, really believe in that, that's going to be communicated. So whether you know your company is because of an ethical mission, or whether it's about health or about the environment, the real issue comes when you scale, when you get bigger. How do you ensure that that integrity remains? Because as a founder, we're going to have that integrity. We started our company because we believe in uh, respect for all living beings on this planet and trying to do something that will preserve that. But how do you make sure that all of your employees feel the same way and somewhere when you're at a trade show that your marketing team isn't going to digress and start presenting your product in a different way, for example. I've seen that happen time and time again as companies get bigger and bigger. And the integrity, the original mission, the original vision of the founder gets watered down or, or it just disappears altogether. And next thing you know, you've got marketing departments or salespeople that are no longer representing the integrity of the company and are selling in a different way. So I think that is the bigger challenge. And the question is, how do you oversee that and make that uh, something that is seamless to the very, very end, no matter how big of a company you get? Which means that you have to create a culture of integrity within the company. You have to actively think about, how do I create the best culture possible where everyone in the company understands the mission and the vision of the company that will ensure the integrity goes down to the last person on the production line. Uh, and this is something that you have to work on each and every single day to ensure that it happens. Um, I, I, we made it a top priority at the office. And uh, you know, I hope that we, we are able to carry that through. Well said. Uh, I'll talk about the product side of it. We focus on introducing jackfruit because it's the meatiest plant on the planet. So all of our products have jackfruit as the number one ingredient. 
try my best to be the one that's crafting those messages. Uh, we, we do work with a creative team right now that is, is starting to help us with our messaging a little bit more, but I'm still very much steering them. I think that the traditional way that a working with a marketing team works is that they come to you and they present these concepts and, um, and they try to give you your voice and then with us we're sort of doing the opposite where I'm telling them this is what I want to achieve, this is the message I want to tell, this is the tone that I want to set, these are the messages, um, you know, the, the values that are important to me that I want to convey to our audience. And they're able to sort of craft that. Uh, and then they gave a general concept uh, based on my uh, guidance. And then I come back and I put it in my voice because no one's going to be able to do that for me. As much as you try to coach them, it's still, it's not, whenever I see it, I, I say, that I would never say that. Like, I, there was some example the other day that'll come to me, but it was uh, Bay. They used Bay or Boo. They said Boo. They said, this plan means for you, Boo. And I said, I would never say Boo. That's a weird slang that I don't even understand. And that would never come out of our brand's voice. So it's always being able to stand up to say, no, no, that's not quite right. And be sure about what you're putting out there. Um, so it starts with me, but we do have a team that, that helps. And um, Mike is very instrumental. Cheryl, who's in the audience here, adds her um, opinions on how we represent our brand. So it's, it's a team effort. Um, but I, I think it, it originates with the passion that I have for uh, sharing our voice. Yeah, so absolutely. I think the founder's voice must carry through all of the messaging. Uh, you know, our team is a little bit bigger um, as we grow. I mean, initially, you know, we really didn't have uh, a marketing team. We do now. We got a number of people in marketing, including social media, and, and we put together. We were lucky enough to find a creative agency initially that put us through an entire branding process to figure out how do we represent our brand to the public in a way that resonates. And it was, a, it was almost a, a multi-month process to really, really refine the brand voice, talk about our mission, our vision, etc., how to best represent it. Uh, luckily, it was a vegan. Um, creative team, creative agency, and we liked their work so much that it was just a husband and wife team. We brought a husband on as our creative director. Uh, and we have, we continually have meetings to talk about how we represent this. And to be perfectly honest, initially, or there was a period where we kind of veered off and we were really focusing more on the technological aspects of our brand. And we finally said, you know, that's not really who we are. We had created this tagline called Tomorrow's Creamery. And we realized Tomorrow's Creamery is today. We're already doing that. So let's go back to who we really, really are, which is talking about compassion. So we recently updated our logo. That's going to be on our next line of packaging where it says Miyoko's and underneath it, savor compassion. That's the message that we started out with when we got a, a slogan called Compassion is Our Culture. And we decided that is who we are to the very, very core. We're all on the same page about that. And, you know, that in the, uh, I gotta do this for some of you who haven't seen it already, uh, the, uh, the phenomenally vegan hashtag. This is something I got this, uh, this, this tattoo uh, over a year ago. I did it on Facebook Live about a year and a half ago. I waited until I was 60 before I got a tattoo, so there you go, you know. Before I go, I can't go to a Japanese onset or a hot tub or a hot springs anymore because they don't allow tattoos. So there I just uh, cut myself off from one of the most culturally, uh, I don't know, enjoyable things that I used to do when I visited Japan. But anyway, um, doing what I believe in. So this is what we're doing. Um, it's, it's messaging that we defined in the very, very beginning. And it's getting a team of people together that will echo that voice louder than and louder than you can do yourself. So I'm proud to say that we have a team, uh, a marketing team that is completely behind this mission, and we each and every single one of us live it every single day uh, throughout all in throughout everything that we do in our company. Our mission is threefold. It's really about how do we help the farmers um, and, and help them from all the same kinds of income that we're bringing to them, from the jackfruit uh, to consumers, and how do we provide something that is really what they're looking for, for their health and for their lives. Uh, it's also for the planet. We're helping to reduce one of the top 10 contributors to global warming, the meat industry, with you know, one of the most sustainable plants on the planet. Um, and, and so addressing really two of the top 10 contributors to global warming, one of them being deforestation. So I think one of the challenges for us has been with everything that we have to say about jackfruit, everything we have to explain. I mean, people have never heard of jackfruit, it defies all the laws of what typically fruits are. Um, you 
lives. So you need to lead with a message that is, you know, whatever's going to be most compelling because you can't tell them 10 messages and expect them to hear it all of them or even expect really more than one to stick. So I think it's an interesting case where, um, you know, the, the, the first thing that motivated me is, is not necessarily, you know, what we're most intent on messaging to the world. It's again about what's going to be the easiest point of entry for you know, somebody who's unfamiliar with jackfruit to embrace it in all its awesomeness, which is, you know, whole food plant based aspects. One of the big changes in food also that's come about is the rise of direct consumer from e-commerce as well as subscription services for food. Um, so what do you see is kind of the continual role of retailers and have your brands been looking at these other alternative means of selling to consumers? I'm sorry, I, I'm still having trouble hearing you. Maybe because I think the sound is going out that way. So they can't hear either, um, so we got our best on the Okay, sorry. So I said one of the big changes in the food industry has been uh, the rise of e-commerce and selling directly to consumers as well as subscription services. Um, most all the brands are, are uh, through retail right now. But where do you see the roles of these new means of selling um, to the food industry, and are your brands looking into these um, methods of selling as well? Yeah, well, you know, um, we started out strictly as e-commerce and selling a perishable product, which is always a challenge. If you're non-perishable, it's much, much easier. As we grew in retail, our e-commerce kept shrinking as a percentage of our business. And most recently, we offloaded it to milkguys.com. We formed a partnership with them, where if you go to our website and go to the store, it automatically directs you to Milk Guys. Because why not let people who do it better do it for you and you concentrate on what you do best? Now, as I talk to other companies, you know, whether it's Beyond Meat or Impossible or many of these other companies, um, about 40 to 50 percent of their uh, or day out of following around 40 to 50 percent of their sales is now coming from food service. This is a critical aspect of growing a brand because a lot of people may not buy something from a retailer. But if they, you know, if they see your, if they have a pizza at a restaurant that has your cheese on it and it's branded, they're going to be far more likely to purchase it at retail. So they can be very synergistic. They can support each other. The retail can support the food service. The food service can support the retail. And studies show that more and more consumers are buying things online. So these markets, whether it's Thrive or Milk Buys, etc., are going to be escalating. So why not partner with the people that can do it best? especially if you have a perishable product. If you have a non-perishable, uh, e-commerce is a great platform. I've talked to many companies that are doing things like powders or bars or something perishable, and they're doing fantastically. Uh, for us, it adds another layer of complexity, which is why we think it's better to let those who do it better do it for us. Yeah, so let's say, so for a new entrepreneur starting a, starting a company, it's definitely a lot of advice out there today about going to e-com first, and I would just say, again, definitely, as, as Diego was saying, temperature state matters, it's going to be a lot easier to go e-com first if you have a shelf-stable offering. Um, it's just, you know, there's a, there's a significant burden of you know, shipping costs for refrigerator, frozen product to the consumer, so it's harder to build a new brand that way, whereas you can have a trial quite easily and, you know, repeat if it's a shelf-stable product. And, to buy, to trial and purchase. Yeah, similar story with us. Uh, we have a perishable product as well. Uh, we do uh, our own e-commerce through our website. We have not expanded to anything like Amazon or any of the meal kits yet, uh, mostly because of the, the temperature state and the additional cost of shipping uh, the cold ship products. It, it becomes very popular, costly on the side of the consumer who's purchasing that product. So we do offer free shipping through our website, and I think that if you are considering doing e-commerce, finding a way to offer free shipping, however you configure it, so that the person who purchases your product sees free shipping, I think that that really does help them flip that buy now button. Um, so however you need to configure it financially to make it work on your end, I think that that's, that's a good uh, suggestion to try to keep that in mind. Uh, we do have a shelf stable product releasing a little bit later this year, and we, we likely will start expanding our e-commerce to some of those other channels uh, now that we don't have to worry about the temperature. Uh, my final question for the panel here is: if, Do you have? A, do you feel like you have an X factor that helped uh, bring you to success in the food world? 
maybe something like a little counterintuitive or surprising, what would it be? Someone just called me Willy Wonka a few hours ago. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's totally it, but I think for us it's, it's sheer determination and just ruthless grit. Like we want this so bad because we believe in it so much. And I think if you have that sort of passion and fire in you, um, it's you kind of unstoppable because you're just going to keep trying and not going to take no for an answer. And you're gonna keep, you know, you won't go in a straight line if you hit a wall, you're going to find a way around it. And um, I think if you have that passion and that drive, that's, that's going to be your secret sauce. Um, and that's something that only you can do. You're not going to get that from somebody else. So you have to sort of find that within yourself. And if you have that, you believe so fiercely in, in your mission. Um, and you can communicate that and build that culture around those, um, those actions. And, and I think that that's what's going to help anybody succeed. You know, I, this is a really, really something very, very important that I'm going to say. It all depends on what kind of business you want to grow, but if you want to scale that and you want to be that hundred million dollar company or whatever, you got to find the best team you can. You have to hire the best people out there. You have to hire people that are better than you in every single way, whether it's finance or marketing or R&D or sales. And at one point, you, can, you think that you know you're the best and you can do it all by yourself, and you can't. You can if you're trying to keep it small. If you want to scale, you got to find the best team out there and you have to trust them. And you have to delegate. And you have to oversee them and make sure that they carry forth your vision. So finding that alignment is extremely uh, important, uh, that they, they share your mission and they can exemplify that. But you've got to be able to trust in people and grow the best team you possibly can. Absolutely agree <laughs> with both of those, and thank you for being most commonly said um, as an entrepreneur is that grit is just so critically important. I remember at some point way back, I'd actually considered becoming a musician, and my my violin teacher told me, you know, don't do it unless you cannot live without it because it would just be that hard. And uh, when I was starting this company and, and choosing how uh, to proceed forward with medical school, I was totally happily happy being in medical school that I could see that your timing was something medical school could be there later if I really wanted to go back, and this company would not. And it was a decision of, you know, could I could I ever look back at life and be happy if I didn't take this forward? Um, it's not that like I, I don't know, it was it was kind of that question again of could you live without this? you live without doing this? And the answer is no. And that's, you know, if you have that grit and that drive and that passion and you're so deeply connected and committed to what you're going to do, absolutely, go do it. If anyone has any questions, there are two microphones set up on either side. Got one in the front right here. Say your name and um, why you're here. My name is Katrina Fox um, and uh, my background is journalism I have a podcast called Being Business Talk and I'm basically helping entrepreneurs to raise the profile of their brands. Um, like you know, I love the fact that we've got three brands there all led by women and that's uh, partly what my question is to do with. It's probably aimed perhaps more directly at me and I'm kind of certainly interested in the other panelists' experience. What particular challenges or discrimination of anything have you experienced over the years as a female entrepreneur and how do you see that changing? You know, I, I think it's mostly laughing with stuff that happens to me where I'll be standing in a booth at a trade show or something and some, some guy will come up and talk to, uh, you know, they will, they'll just ignore me because I'm, I'm not only a woman but I'm an Asian, I'm just like this, you know, this little old Asian lady they just assume I'm like nobody, I'm just like, you know, they're a cup of cheese or something. And they'll go and talk, they will literally just go right past me and they'll go and talk to one of my male employees as if they're the CEO. And then they'll come over and talk to me and they look absolutely shocked. I know this is really, really weird, but it happens. There is just sort of this, this sort of subconscious discrimination that happens among people. It even happens with women where they just discredit me because I'm just, you know, unless they know me. To be perfectly honest, however, I face absolutely zero discrimination among investors and people who know who I am. Or that, you know, the little old Asian lady is the one who started this company. I've had no discrimination whatsoever. 
Um, so that has not been a problem whatsoever in, you know, when, in the know. It's just when someone doesn't know you, they just have this subconscious, um, I don't know what it is. But, all right, you then tell me what it is. <laughs> Anyone else want to pick up? Any other questions? Just curious, how many people are interested in starting their own uh, food companies here? Raise your hand. Right. Good deal. Right. If there are no other questions, uh. Hi, I'm Dawn, and uh, I run a consumer research consulting firm. And I'm curious about who your customers are. I actually have a hypothesis that your demographics are a little different from each other. Because um, obviously vegan and plant based is such a huge category. So if you could take it up a little bit on like, the specifics on your customers, that would be great. Thanks. Um, it's a little hard to say who's buying our products at the retail level, but I can tell you who's engaging with our brand. Um, you know, we're getting the millennials, um, particularly I think because 91% of millennials are looking for value certain brands. Um, 85% of the general public are looking for value certain brands. So I think we're looking for, our consumers are people who care um, more broadly. Specifically, people who are engaging with our brands, we've got mostly that 24 to 36 year bracket, um, and they're primarily female, about 75 to our 25% split. Uh, but I think that we do have an older demographic uh, that is you know, starting to find our brand because they're starting to question their health and what's best for their health. And that's something we see our very first farmer's market, I remember Mike and I being really surprised. We thought it would be a bunch of 18 and 24 year olds who were like, yay, vegan. But it was actually the older customers who were coming up to us and saying, we're so happy we found your brand. We have to change the way we eat because we have health problems because our, our hearts are failing because we've you know, not cared about our health for years and we're sick and they're looking for our products. And so that was really remarkable to us in the beginning. Um, and I think it's really broad. There's no wrong reason um, to eat more plants and it's, it's good for everybody. And so I think that the, the types of consumers who are after our products is becoming much more broad. Sure. Um, yeah, I would say millennials are definitely the number one consumer for meat alternatives. Um, we also see Time for two more questions. Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Veronica, and I'm not, I don't work in this industry, but I'm very interested in that based eating. Um, I'm sure all of your products are extremely popular in um, you know, high density areas of the coastlines. How have you been able to, if at all, penetrate other markets like the Midwest, the middle of the country, or more uh, suburban? Uh, the strategy for, uh, for us has been to um, have partnerships with unlikely retailers. So people, retailers that people would assume to be unlikely. We're from North Carolina, um, and, and not a major metropolitan area. We're from Asheville, from the mountains. Um, and so where I live in particular, I live much closer to a small grocery store called Bagels, which is like a local regional chain at about 150 retailers. Um, I live closer to that store than I do at Whole Foods. So we do unlikely uh, conventional partnerships. Walmart, we were wondering about backlash, backlash on that. The reason that we did that is because a lot of people, myself included, live close to a Walmart. They don't live close to a natural grocery store. We want accessibility for everybody. And so we're going to partner with these people that, that others might not understand, but it, it makes strategic sense for us because part of our mission is getting more of this food into more mountains across the country. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, the landscape is changing so rapidly that retailers everywhere want the products. Uh, we're seeing some of our biggest work in the Midwest. So, uh, so, so the Midwest is one of our biggest areas today. I think it's, I don't think it matters where it is. People want these products. question is, as you've grown, it seems like a lot of your brands started kind of small and then morphed and gone into successful retailers so that we don't have a pretty significant scale. Um, my name is Scott Wall, I'm a man with Gary, we're a face nutrition company, so this is kind of an ingredients question. But has your ingredient base evolved as your need for a much larger supply of so take that on and do well, I guess you you use jackfruit, you use Saint and you're probably going to be the jack. You're going to be using jackfruit as your supply chain because you're the jackfruit company, right? Um, you know, I, I think we have a little bit more uh, room to change our substrate. We started initially with, with cashews that we import from Vietnam um, because we wanted to narrow that supply chain, be able to buy in bulk. Um, you know, we buy over a million pounds of, of cashews a year right now. Um, but we're actually switching. I mean, not, not giving up on cashews. We'll continue making those products. But we want to bring the price point down to reach a lighter demographic. So we're launching a new line of products, new line of cheeses later this year. That'll be based on potatoes, legumes, uh, oats, seeds, rice. So that'll be made with things that grow from the ground here in the United States. Um, and so, you know, I think you can evolve, um, and maybe someday you'll be more than just jackfruit. You'll find another ingredient, some amazing thing that you want to incorporate too, that will have the same, uh, uh, you know, texture and, and opportunity. So, um, and, and you as well too. I think we can all evolve in, in, in incorporating different um, ingredients. Yeah, I think that there there is opportunity to evolve. Um, we, however, have a very high bar for the ingredients that we incorporate in our products. They all started in a home kitchen based on ingredients that we found at our local co op. So that sort of set the bar. If, if the ingredient can't be made from start to finish in a home scale kitchen without a lot of special equipment and know how, then it's not going to end up in our products. So you're not going to find um, heat in our products. You're not going to find um, even the protein isolates in our products because we don't have those dry extruders. We don't have the hexane to process um, you know, uh, pea protein into the isolate pea protein. And so we don't understand what that product is and how it trans translates from its origins as a pea to a pea protein and eat their food at the end. And we want to make sure that our labels continue to be really clean and really transparent. So there's a ton of options out there, but they may not all be appropriate for the type of food that we're trying to create. Yeah, the Jackfruit Company, you've been pioneering the supply chain, fairly vertically integrated, worked directly with over 1,000 farming families, and have access to the agreements in place and process supply chain. Uh, so our, our partners are only able to be jackfruit for us, uh, something that was really important to us. When I started the company, it was also not, like something that I seriously considered, but it's just having it be a supply company and, and not build a brand. And of course it was, it 
there was so much education that needed to be done about jackfruit that we really needed a brand to be able to do that and to create the demand. Um, so we're you know, focused on making sure that at any point in time we have that pathway to create the supply that's 100 times the size of our current market, current demand, and maybe that's an area that we focus on being global leader for. Hey, thank you everybody. Let's give these amazing entrepreneurs a